freedom. How many of you just celebrated the freedom of our country this last weekend? Did you realize that's why you were celebrating? Fourth of July. Some said no, I didn't know what we were doing. It's a great pool party. But is anything really free? Seriously, think about it. Is anything really free? I'm trying to have as much stuff up here as Jim does on Sunday mornings. On I'm free to say that, right? Y'all are quiet. Can you hear me? <laughs> I checked the mail today, and American Express says they've got free miles for me. If I'll just write back. Avis says it's on the Discover card. There's all kinds of free points I can get and all this stuff. And AARP sent me something today. Who knew that when your partner became a member, you also get a free card? It's true. They, they support partner benefits, so there's some free stuff I guess I can get at 47. But the reality is, at the bottom line, under all those things, there's always a little asterisk. You've got to sign up for something. You've got to pay for something. You at least have to give them your email or phone number so they can put you on their list. Is anything really free? The scripture I want to read tonight is Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. One simple line, but oh, the powerful words in that one simple line. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. I want to read it to you out of the Message Bible. They now have the whole Bible in the Message. Thank you, Eugene Peterson. 5.1 in the Message says, Christ has set us free to live a free life. So take your stand. Never again let anyone put a harness of slavery on you. In this particular passage, historically, Paul is addressing the church at Galatia because although they're claiming freedom in Christ and we're following Jesus and all these things, they're falling back into the religious rules of the day. Particularly circumcision was one of the things, you know, that, that's what makes you a child of God. Really? But oh, this, he was addressing it with them. He was confronting the church and saying, listen, it's for freedom that Christ has set you free. So don't let anybody ever put you in bondage again. You're free. Period. But they went back. The truth is, those harnesses of slavery or bondage come in as many shapes and sizes as we come in as people. Oh, definitely religion. Anybody say amen? Anybody experience the bondage of religion? Hello? What about addictions? Drugs, alcohol, sex, shopping? Come on. Now you're meddling, preacher. Unhealthy relationships. Chris prayed for that. We are created as human beings to love one another and to let each other be who we're created to be. But those insecurities rise up and those fears and all those things come up and all of a sudden people try to start making people be who they aren't. It's bondage. When Paul and I started dating, actually on our very first date, we talked about our life. We both came out late in life. We talked about both being married for 12 years to women. I had four children, he had none. I said, I've got that covered. <laughs> but he said the coolest thing to me, because as we discussed our relationships and our past, we both realized that we both were people pleasers and that we had become performers in past relationships. And said, he realized, I was always trying to figure out what they wanted me to be and I'd get down the road a little bit and realize I wasn't being myself. And he said to me, he said, if you'll just be you and I'll be me, and that works, 
what more could anybody want? And that became our cornerstone of our relationship. Because we're very different people in many ways, but in other ways we're very much alike. But the freedom is in that he lets me be who I am, and I let him be who he is. Because the reality is, you cannot control anybody else. There's really one thing we can control in this world, and that's it. I hate to break the news to you. It's our choices. Can't control those Dallas drivers. Can't control the Obama traffic as I was 30 minutes late getting here. That lost my religion over that one. <laughs> so many ways that we can become in bondage. But anytime something or someone puts you in captivity, you're not free. A few years ago at SeaWorld in Florida, you may remember the story, a young orca trainer was killed when this giant well, thousands and thousands of pounds, who'd been in captivity for many years, turned and took this young woman's life. And in this video clip is a response to some people who have been around that industry for a long time. Listen to these words. Captivity definitely, without a doubt, increases the stress level of these animals, and stress leads to frustration. Frustration leads to aggression. We now know that they live in such strong nuclear families. To pull them out of that environment for human entertainment is basically old school. Old school. When I heard those words, I thought, what, what, what does that mean, old school? And what came to me was, old school is doing it the way people always used to do it. Hello, church. Well, that's the way we've always done it that way. That's what we should do. We just keep on doing it. Or, or in a business sense, well, it's always been profitable. It's easier to do that than to, you know, find a way to let these animals live in their natural environment. So we'll, we'll captivate them and make it profitable. And then someone loses a life. That's not freedom. Old school has continued to live in a controlled or slave-like state. Maybe because that's the way it's always been done. Maybe because it's profitable. Or maybe just because that way of living has become accustomed. It's become what's normal for us as humans. But it's not free. When you and I live in captivity, when we're not living in the freedom of who we're created to be, we find ourselves like these wells, stressed out, frustrated, and unfortunately, sometimes aggressive. I call it acting out sideways. You know, you can perform for a while, you can, you can try to do it the right way for a while, but if it does not fit the design of who you are created to be, you may do it for a year, you may do it for 10 years, you may do it for 20 years. You may do it to your last day, but at some point, you will act out sideways. Unfortunately, the church, and I speak as the church as a whole, an organization, an institution, if you will, that was being created to help people build relationship with the living God. And many times, and many of our experiences have become so legalistic that the rules and the regulations and all those things become the thing that we think gets us closer to God, and it's actually the thing that pulls you away. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10 says this, For by grace you have been set free through faith. That's what saved means. Set free. The freedom of Christ comes in. For by grace you've been set free through faith. And this is not of your own doing. Hello? It is the gift of God. Not the results of works, so that no one can boast. For we are exactly how God made us. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. You hear what's going on there? We've been set free by grace 
You can't work for it. You can't be good enough for it. You can't keep enough rules. You can't meet the requirements of the person or the religion or whatever it is. Yet, what we're created to do is good works. To love people. To love ourselves. But somewhere along the way, we all have our own story. Something or someone or a combination thereof sent us a message that was not true. You're not loved. You're not good enough. You're not pretty. You're not the right height. You don't have enough hair. You can't see all the way back there. But Psalms 139 says the exact opposite. And I want you all to hear this word tonight. Because as y'all were singing, I thought I might just toss this whole thing aside because I think if anything God wants us to hear tonight is these words, and for everyone in this room to understand in the depths of their being that they are uniquely and wonderfully created in the image of God. For it was you who formed me. You formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, that I know full well. My frame was not hidden from you, when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days of my life. When none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God, how vast is the sum of them. I try to count them they are more than the sand. I come to the end, and I am still with you. You see, where I think religion has missed it, particularly Christianity, we think we're right. <laughs> oh, we've got the formulas. We can tell you all the steps to take down the Romans road and all these things. This is the way you've got to do it. When I read the scripture more and more as I read it, it seems to me it's already been done. We were created for good works before we were even around. We were created uniquely and wonderfully exactly as we are. Gay, straight, bi, tries, whatever. Uniquely, wonderfully created to do good works. I come to the end and I'm still with you. There is one harness though that concerns me for all of humanity because <laughs> it's one of the greatest harnesses or the greatest bondages of slavery that can affect all of us. And it's the bondage or the slavery of unforgiveness. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Christ didn't set us free to hold on to stuff. When I came out, some of you know my story, um, my best friend from college uh, was my best man at my wedding, and I was in his. We were best friends all through school. We came to Jesus together. We went into ministry together. And I even told he and my wife, because of the promise I'd made to myself in college, that I had struggled with homosexuality before I got married. But I noticed, after I told him that, he was different. Kind of kept distance. You just felt it. But when I finally came to the end of my performance, and just said, here I am, God, I've got to accept myself and love myself. 
The Sunday after, his church was really growing, and it had grown to about probably 10 or 12,000 people. He preached a sermon. Let, uh, answer the questions. Supposedly people write questions in, and he responds to these questions. And one of the questions was, what do you do if a friend or loved one is homosexual? And he said, well, if they're not a Christian, they haven't done the right steps, you love them and show them the way and help them see that's not right. But if they claim to be Christian and choose to be gay, you dust your feet of them and don't even share a meal. Oh my God. I was not only angry for myself, I thought to myself, you bleep, 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 bleep. Do you realize you just told an elderly couple in your church when their lesbian daughter comes home for Thanksgiving, which she does once a year, they're not to eat with her. Do you realize what you just did? I was angry. And going through the divorce and all those things, the greatest loss was not tucking my kids in at night. But second to that, quality time with my kids was the loss and rejection of this friend. So about four years went by, and every time I would think about it, I mean, it would just be that heat, just ooh, things I could do. Come on, y'all been there. <laughs> Schemes and thoughts that God's going, no, don't do it. And one day God tapped on my heart and said, Todd, you need to forgive him. I'm like, what? But, da, 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 da. So I called, picked up the phone and I called and I said, I need to tell you something. I've been angry with you for four years. And I want you to know I forgive you. He sat there, uh. He goes, I don't know what to say. I said, you don't have to say anything. I said, this is for me. I said, I do ask you to forgive me. It was never my intention to hurt people, but I know people got hurt. And for that, I'm, I am sorry. But I forgive you for the wounds I've been carrying and for the power I've given you over my life. And I'm telling you, folks, I didn't feel that one bit. This was an act of faith. <laughs> I didn't feel it the next day, or the next day, or the next year. But I didn't notice what was happening. It was about four years after that. I was working on my ordination stuff. I thought I ought to call him up. He may not agree with my theology, but he knows I'm a pastor. We work together. Well, I wasn't really thinking. You know, pastor is like the third largest church in the nation that takes a stance against who I am. <laughs> probably not going to write me a letter of recommendation. <laughs> and when I called, and he said, you know, I really can't do that. And I thought, oh, yeah, I could still throw you under the bus if I wanted to. I said, I am sorry. Forget that I even asked. But we started talking. Now, my friend and I were pastors in a Methodist church, and I just got a confession to make here. I've grown to love liturgy and robes and all those things and understand what their purpose is. But when I was in the Methodist church and we had to put that thing on, Ugh. <laughs> really? Is this about Jesus? Uh-huh. We're all walking up there in our robes, and he and I would just laugh because neither one of us were very liturgical. And so he started asking, how are things at your church? I said, you know, it's really good. I said, it's a little higher church than I'm used to. But boy, those gays, they can sing and play instruments like nobody else. And he started laughing, and we had this exchange. And when I hung up the phone, I realized... My God, I'm free. I did not have one thought of ill will toward him. I did not feel the anger. It was an act of faith. Corey Ten Boom, in her book, The Hiding Place, says this, even as the angry, vengeful thoughts boiled through me, I saw the sin of them. 
Jesus Christ had died for this man. Was I going to ask for more? Lord Jesus, I prayed, forgive me and help me to forgive him. Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. And so I discovered that it is not on our forgiveness anymore than on our goodness that the world's healing hinges, but on his, meaning Jesus. When Jesus tells us to love our enemies, he gives along with the command the love itself. That's freeing. We don't have to be good enough for God. We don't have to keep rejecting the unique and wonderful things about ourselves that we were told were not so special. We don't have to allow others to control us, to have power over us, or take our choices away from us. Is anything really free? Sure. You may not have to pay money to come in here and hear wonderful music, but we hope we make a donation later. We can take a walk on the Katy Trail. It doesn't cost us anything financially. But the truth is, someone somewhere stood firm. For 44 years, this church has stood firm. Stood firm on the truth that whom the sun sets free is free indeed. For freedom, Christ has set us free. So let's stand firm. Amen.